a friend and welcome to Strange New Broadcast episode 2.4 Among the Lotus Eaters with Amory and Peter. Hello, I am being fueled by whiskey and cold meds. This probably won't go well, but anyway. Yeah, I'm being fueled by beer and cold meds. Go <laughs> us. Yes. <laughs> we have quite a great deal of previously on from tomorrow and tomorrow, etc. Uh, we heard from Mr. Martin. I did wonder if this one was another that needed a rewrite due to Anson Mount being on paternity leave. Mm. Mm. Kirk feels like a square peg here, whereas Pike would have been a better fit. Well, yeah. not with Lance not with him, no. <laughs> he says. Yes. Yeah. Quite right, Martin, yes. And we've heard from Thomas McCambly, who says, as a Canadian listener, I'll weigh in. Yes, Amory, we have bingo, but it's pretty much <laughs> indoors this time of year. I mean, that's what I thought, but... Because we do bingo indoors, yes, not outdoors. I don't know why you went to a bingo place, but there we go. I, yeah, no, sorry, I'm broken. Anyway, mm. I can't speak to how much outdoor chess is actually done in Canada, but I can imagine a few hardy souls would play every now and then. Personally, I think he went with chess as the scamming game just because Kirk would have less competition than a room full of people are waiting for one ball to be called. To be fair, you are right. If he's good at chess, the odds of him winning are higher yeah, than... Yeah, yeah. We, that, that's a thing, isn't it? Yeah. And he, he makes the point that it's a lot simpler than the 3D chess he's used to as well. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know why I went... But I did. I'm broken. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, Toronto is a special case with regard to the Canadian weather. Due to its size and location along Lake Ontario, they get less snow and it generally has a warmer climate in winter than the rest of us. Compare it to Ottawa, where I live, which is in the middle of the snow belt, it is only 350 kilometres away from Toronto and gets something like two to three metres of snow over the winter. No, That's no. a lot of snow. Of course, given global warming and the fact that we've been experiencing a winter this year, it's been both 10 degrees warmer and we've yet to reach one metre of snow on the ground by March this year. Shit. Oh, and wire bridge? There's a lot of trade and travel between Canada and the US and most of it's ground travel, trucks and trains. A fixed link like this would save many hours of travel around the lake. Oh, that's fair enough. Thank you. Sorry about the bingo obsession and thank you very much for your feedback. Good to hear from a Canadian. Excellent. Yeah. A Canuck? A Canuck. We also heard from Christian Honore. 90 minute drive at the best of times between Buffalo and Toronto, apparently. So, yeah, that's worth cutting down, isn't it? Yeah. Boss assist to say they sold gold items to raise money in the Super Scouts episode of Galactica 1980. Gosh. Well... How sad are you for remembering that, boss? Please, <laughs> please tell me you didn't rewatch it. Oh, don't. Also, I remember seeing outdoor chess in Montreal in May. Oh. Um, Pyman and Drew said that, uh, pointed out the. You remember I was saying, I, I'm sure I remembered that gold in a comm badge being used as currency. Yeah. It's data in Time's Arrow. Okay. There you are. I wasn't being mad. No. But then you then you went and ran a poll, even yes. though I said I was probably the only person. Well, you weren't, as it turned out. Oh, okay. Uh, the poll was very interesting. So finding out who who people's top Kirk was, uh, top Kirk. The most effectual top cat, whose intellectual close friends get to call him DC, providing it's <laughs> that won't make sense to any Americans who had was it no boss, oh, boss cat. cat wasn't it yes and we, we had couldn't top ha- cat Why or we... the other way round anyway it was the name of cat food we couldn't have it in this country so we changed it it, it was called boss cat in this country but it actually is top cat because that's why it's called TC isn't it yes yes but oh. top cat was the name of a brand of cat food in and this country so we had to have boss, boss cat, cat instead which didn't make any sense but no. anyway sorry sorry another little I, you know you're just delaying the exciting I'm results sorry. of this poll I'm know? taking us down a load of tangents I'm not well leave me alone <laughs> so on Facebook uh, there were 24 votes uh, original flavour chat got 41% of the votes so not even half interestingly yeah uh, strange new flavour aka Paul Wesley got 20% Exactly the same as Captain Quincy, 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 Taggart, Taggart, Taggart. Yeah. Bizarrely. Wow. And Zach Brannigan managed to get 12%, despite actually not being on the original poll. Yes, thank you for that, Andy. Yeah. It's about that revenge for all those expanse trailers I've been putting in. Probably. And uh, poor old 09 flavour, a.k.a. Chris Pine, only got 4%, to a.k.a. one vote. Okay. Oh, He proved a little more popular on the old tumblers. Yeah. Where there were 13 votes. Uh, original Kirk got s- nearly 70% of the votes, so quite overwhelming. Then uh, Chris Pine Fresh came second with 15.5%. Uh, whereas Paul Wesley and Tim Allen both drew on 7.5%. <laughs> 
So there we go. It's not that you're the only one who likes him, but he's certainly not as popular as the original Kirk, unsurprisingly. Well, we, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that I'm in the minority, but it works for me. It's my own head cannon. There we go. Whereas tonight we're recovering Among the Lotus Eaters. <sighs> What to do with eating cars, as you said last time? Sorry. I think I, was, I, I think I was already ill last yeah, time. Yeah, I, I didn't think you were. No, sorry. Uh, the title comes from the Odyssey. Oh, we're going well, to a Ulysses place now. The titular flower munchers did so to place themselves in a state of peaceful apathy. So the ancient version of watching daytime TV, in other words. Oh, OK. Yeah. So it kind of fits. But another wanky title for, you know. Yeah. That's all we seem to get is wanky titles in this. But there we are. <laughs> yeah. Zach, you're alive. I, I thought. Does it ease your conscience? I, I'm, I'm just happy to see you. Are we meant to know this person? He's a KIA from the report. Only I wasn't killed in action. I was left behind. Zach, they told me that you went down. But you never saw it for yourself. You didn't bother to confirm it. Zach. It's High Lord Zacharias. That's what they call me here. You'll do the same. I'm a long way from your men. I mean, your men with phaser rifles probably helped. We're here now. We can fix whatever mistakes we made. It's a little late for that. And you have a, a captain's log and Pike is in this episode yeah. <gasps> Yay <laughs> Suddenly starts feeling more like strange new worlds. <laughs> They're on a joint mission with Battelle's ship, something to do with a binary star. The USS Cayuga yep. named for one of the indigenous peoples of North America. Okay. Fair and enough. also those US naval vessels are the same as the Enterprise. Yep, fair enough. And he's having some personal time with Captain Patel, and she gives him an ancient mariner's keystone. Um, Euphemism. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How? Maybe not. Maybe not. <sighs> <laughs> Is that what they call him these days? Okay. Is it battery powered? No, no. Let's just carry on. Carry on. Wow. Again, cold meds and whiskey. Right. <laughs> Well, if he's making you smutty, I mean that, then I'll Yeah, I? maybe, maybe. Well, I'll have passed out long before, of course. <sighs> yeah, be snoring all night. Yeah, <laughs> probably. With the fat whiskey has on me, unfortunately. It does. Yes, you are very snorry. So is the dog. Yeah, well, but not that we give our dog whiskey. She, she's no, snorry she's just without snorry without it, yeah. As I, actually, she um, um, when we first got her about a year ago, she was with us everywhere we went, and she snored a lot on the podcast, didn't she? Mm-hmm. Anyway, Mattel's been waiting for a message from an admiral and it comes through and she hasn't got the promotion she wanted because the Vulcan asshole in the trial episode is punishing her. What did you call him? Oh, Pasolk. Yes. <laughs> he's still Pasolking. And then, so understandably, Pike worries about that. It's like, you know, he's punishing yeah, you for me. Me. Then he's like, is this a good idea? I'm hurting your career. We only ever have a moment here, a moment there. And even though she's just given him a fucking present yeah. that clearly had a lot of mean she knew she knows him well enough to know it had a lot of meaning and she's taken care over it. He's then like, Yeah, we need to, you know, take some time out. Yeah. Cause he's a bit of a dick. Well, you know, it's it's good that he's not flawless. Everybody's yeah. gotta have a flaw somewhere and he's obviously he's different to Kirk, which is nice. So yeah, well I quite like the fact that he's a bit bumbling in love. <laughs> Yeah, but that's... I can empathise with that. <laughs> if if she hadn't just given him a really awesome present, I could probably understand uh-huh. it, that he... Well, you've got to remember that that was like, uh, judging by the way they've played this, about an hour ago, because, <laughs> you know, she's had this long conversation. He's had loads of time to stew over the fact that maybe he's screwed up her career. You can kind of understand it, and all said. I mean, yeah, it's the wrong call, but it's un- understandable that he's worried that he's damaging her career and stuff. Yeah. So. But they're calling it off as obviously she leaves. And then there's a sensitive communique about Rigel 7. Rigel 7 has featured in the cage. Yes, they're where the cool map of the castle comes from. And they kind of sort of recreate that in this. OK. Do you think about it? I don't remember the cage. Oh, come on. The, the classic image of the cage is that map painting that appears at the end of so many episodes of the original series. Does it? OK. Now I'm going to have to Google it for you, aren't I? Yes. <sighs> dear, oh dear. Carry anyway, on. While he's doing that, there had been a very brief expedition to Rydal 4. It sounds like it was, a, it, was, it was an emergency evacuation, an emergency landing, so it wasn't a planned mission. 
and they were pre-warp civilization. They were only there for four hours. Three crew died. Spock would have been among them if they hadn't been able to leave. Um, because it's pre-warp, it's being monitored, but there's stuff to do with radiation, so it's, it's usually photographs, basically, like spy planes kind of thing. Anyway, the latest data has come in. Oh, that one. It yeah. didn't have gold domes. It, it, you're right. They, they, they shied away from these slightly Islamic-looking gold domes, didn't they? Yeah. Probably as far. For the best. Well, they're either Russian, one of their Eastern, because you get them in yeah. Russia, don't you? Yeah, it's a general Eastern thing, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Anyway, no gold domes. That's probably why I didn't make the connection. <laughs> so, anyway, the latest f- photographs have come back and they include a Star Trek Delta, and that can only have come as a result of this very brief evac mission. And so there's clearly been c- cultural contamination, and it's like the Enterprise is being left to clear up its own mess. Pike says to uh, says he needs the arm, which you know doesn't bite an eyebrow. She's chief of security, fine, but he says he needs Mbenga. He's like, oh, I need you, and she's like, I you need a doctor on a cultural contamination mission, prime directive mission. It's like, yeah, I need you, and it turns out that he needs people who are good at unarmed Your combat. Your fisticuffs. Yeah. yeah. But then he says it's going undercover, so there's no uniform. And then Una has spotted the Pike isn't quite himself. And she's like, ah, oh, so you did the thing you do. And he's like, what mm-hmm. thing? Do you push people away when they get close? She's like, what? Do I do, do, I do that? She's like, mm-hmm. yes, you do that. You dobber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look on his face like, ooh, <laughs> rumbled. Yeah. yeah. I mean, fair enough. It, he wouldn't. He's not done it deliberately. He's no. not made some kind of conscious choice. No, no, but you can sort of see the penny dropping. It's like, oh, I do do that, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> Bless. Yeah. And then after your teaser, you've got Ortega's doing a personal log, and she's wearing... I mean, it is pointed out to her that she's wearing a daft hat. Yes. Um, <laughs> she looks so sweet in it. She that? does, yeah. A smurf. <laughs> yes, yeah. And Erica Ortega, and she, you know, she flies the ship, but today she gets to be in the landing party. But as they get there, they, it's Spock appears and says where they are. There's this volatile debris and it's something that's going to need piloting by hand with corrections every 20 minutes and only she can do it. So she's, of course, disappointed. And then she's like, well, who's going to fly the shuttle? And Pike's like, don't remember, I was a test pilot. And I wondered, was he? As in, yeah, in yeah, the original so. series, was he a test pilot? Oh, I can't remember when they established that, but it's been around a while, I think. OK, so. fair enough. Just wondered. So, of course... She's pissed off, and then Spock sort of tries to explain, and 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 she's just like, "You just need to know when to shut up." And yeah. he's like, "I'm working on." It. Shush. Shush. Yes. <laughs> so they come in, and the shuttle under cloud cover. Oh, some fantastic shots! Yeah, it's coming really in on the planet. Good. Mm, yeah, very nice. And then they've got a trek through hostile terrain in order that they're not they're not spotted and don't make the cultural contamination worse, which makes sense. And then um, that's when you find out, yeah, I needed people who can fight, who can manage without a phaser. Because um, sensibly, they're not taking equipment with them, which, which they is, shouldn't yes, ever do. very good. <laughs> I love Lars' reaction to the telescope. Though. Yeah, really? I'm going to fight with this? <laughs> yeah. And then they're walking along and Lars hears ringing in her ears and then forgets and you get a lot more of that. The, the, the only downside with this is, I mean, I, I kind of like their ambition but the, the problem with this volume thing and i haven't noticed this so much when it's been used in star wars the star wars series but it's really clear where the volume ends you know the floor ends the actual practical set and the background starts yeah it reminded me a lot of dot two and the mine robber you know <laughs> when they're in the blank white bit yeah and you can clearly see the line where the floor meets the the white curtains at the back <laughs> very a, blue peter look <laughs> is it it's a bit like cso it's different to CSO. With CSO, you get the lines around people. This, you get the line of where the, the floor meets the wall. I didn't spot that. Yeah. I'll put some pictures up on Facebook and Tumblr, and you'll you'll see what I mean, because every time you can clearly see where the join is, unfortunately. Uh, this is miles better, than obviously, than what we got in the original series, where you could all... You, likewise, you could see, clearly see the join, but that was because the background was so pants. Yeah. And to be honest, the set was so pants as well most of the time. And it's... Better than what we saw in Next Generation as well. I mean, it's probably the best they can achieve with the budget they've got because I think the Marvel shows have a lot more budget. Mm. But, yeah, it's just a bit unfortunate once you realise where the join is. <laughs> yeah, well, which I didn't. So then they come to some people and try and argue that they're from the north, but the guys <laughs> are like, no, we know you come from Starfleet. And then the ringing of Fetz and Benga. 
And then you find that Zach, or one of the three crew that was supposed to be dead, has has survived, and he's made himself the king. And he says, "There's no going back." You're like, "Okay." The throne rooms. It's not a set actually. They're filming on location for this. Okay. It's in a, a community center in Ontario, a retreat center basically. Oh. And you can, if you Google it, Mount Community Center, you'll see what this looks like when it's not lit like they've yeah. lit it and. It's it's sort of medieval style, basically bank, banqueting, and obviously they've put a lot more detail in. But it's a very clever bit of location shooting because I thought it was a really well done set extension. But no, it's actually a real place they've gone yeah. to. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I was getting a sort of Mongol vibe, as in a Tin of the Huns. A little of. bit, all the furs. But that's just because yeah. it's so cold there. And I think in the helmet style as well, possibly. And that the throne room was very Norman style cathedral, wasn't it? Yeah. But I liked it. I like. I also the... like the fact the phaser rifles they've got are very like that one from Where No Man Has Gone Before, uh, with the, the sort of the three tubes that yeah. run along it, which of course we only ever saw in that episode. But yeah, that that's the logical way phaser rifles would look like if you're doing it with a bit more budget. <laughs> yeah, I mean, generally, I really do like the aesthetic they've gone for. The, yeah, yeah. The, the the look, and so then he says, "No, you're not having this. So I'm going to you know put you outside, and you're going to forget." So he puts them all in a cage, and yes. Cue more headaches and more tinnitus and forgetting. And then you find it's also affecting the ship because Ahura forgets. Una's in command! It seems like ages the last time she was in command. I really like that. Yeah. But I like the way that they react to Ahura forgetting. Instead of like in a modern sort of office where probably they'd have a go at her. Hmm. It's it's like, all, you need help, don't you? Are, don't are you me? okay? Yeah. You're you're going to sick bay. Someone needs to go and make sure she gets to sick bay. Yeah. You know, I, I like that. It's. I'm not saying that. No workplace would care, but I think in most criticism of whether or not you've done your job would come first. Yeah. In my most, anyway. So I like that bit. Back down on the planet, they can't remember who they are because it's, it's the morning, and this bloke appears and offers to help them. Luke. Yes, spelt with a Q. Really? Uh, yes, L-U-Q. <laughs> uh, it's played by Reed Burney, who all the way through was just reminding me of John Lithgow for some reason. Oh, no, I can see that. I can see that. It's kind yeah. of, you know, sort of yeah. John Lithgow from Wish.com. Lo- yes, yeah. <laughs> but he's a good actor and he, yeah, he plays he em- empathetic really well. Yeah, he does. But a lesser actor wouldn't have been able to make much of that role, but he does a really good job of it. Mm. Uh, they're breaking some rocks. <laughs> Luke says their work is a blessing because it gives them purpose. A very capitalist. He promises to guide them to gain a better forgetting which is the Slay's version of sleep. Again, it's very obvious here where the set ends. But never mind. Lance never suggests... spotted any of this. All right. Lance suggests taking on the guards, but um, Luke says not to. He talks of how they don't lose the deeply known things like walking and talking, which is a line they needed to be there, really, to explain why they don't forget absolutely everything. They also ink their names on their arms, but, of course, Pike works out they haven't got their names on their sleeves. And also that he's, you know, it's clear from his hands he's not been doing much manual labour either. So it can't be from these parts. I, I think Anson Mount plays his character's confusion really well. Yeah. He's like scared that he can't remember stuff, which he would be. And I think I have a lot of criticisms of how this plays out later. Mm. But at this stage, what they're describing in terms of how memory works fits with the early stages of dementia yeah. in most that cases. W- I, I got the feeling that was very much what they were riffing on here. It's like, uh, let's, let's do a future look at dementia and how that affects people and how upsetting and disturbing that can be. And yeah, maybe you may think it's great to be able to forget all the past problems, but actually it just leaves you you know frightened and confused, basically. Yeah. So. And still with the emotions. Yeah, you yeah. know you've lost something. Yeah. You don't know what you've lost. And, yeah, if you do something often enough, it does become unconscious, a muscle memory. Driving, for example, most people who pass their test a while ago don't have to really think about driving, at least most of the time. Some people clearly don't, unfortunately. But, anyway, yeah. it's another but muscle. you know, well, <laughs> there'll be other things as well. That and, and all of that fits with... It doesn't fit with all cases of dementia. There are some where actually the physical memory does go as well, and that's the form that Terry Pratchett had. Mm. But in most cases, it's the memories that they are talking about losing that go first. Yeah. Pike knows his, his necklace is a gift, which is just as well that Battelle gave it to him. 
Yeah. Luke points to emotions being able to guide them where memories can't, which again is a useful workaround from the amnesia that would be too debilitating otherwise. But that's also true with dementia in the earlier uh-huh. stages. Its combination of familiarity and emotion can often help, not necessarily help you remember. I think that's not right. Help centre you. Pike starts off. Fight, 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 fight! And knocks a guard out. Laan gets into another one to protect him and gets slashed in the dummy, complete with very grim blood splash effect. I like right. that. I like that it Again, was this real. Is a grittier trek than we've previously seen. But is, places, do, right? do you remember, was it back when we were doing Next Gen and rather had the whole thing about whether or not people, people were pro- properly, properly dead? dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Laan um, is properly hurt. And Bengo rushes forth to tend her and Luke leads them off to safety in his yurt. Nurse Chapel has isolated their problem and Spock hands out pads with the crew's details on them, which is a nice idea, but fails because they forget how to read. Yeah, and again, that would happen with dementia. Mm-hmm. You you lose that. Una realises they need to leave the source of the radiation, Rigel 7, but uh, just about remembers the away team so that they can't go too far. On an otherwise empty bridge, Spock orders Ortegas to enter the debris field, which will apparently shield them from the radiation, he thinks. Uh, it's the second debris field this season. They're becoming like Strangely World's version of Next Generation's Nebulas. Yeah, they? I was going to say it's a nebula, isn't it? Ortegas develops the I Fly the Ship chant, which is amusing. That's what I like about this episode. I like Ortegas Yeah, in she's this. great. Luke counsels letting them forget about La Anne so they won't mourn her loss, and it's obvious he's got grief, despite not knowing why. She's understandably not happy with that. It's kind of very Monty Python. I'm not dead. Yeah, very. I like <laughs> it. I'm still here. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> He has a literal totem pole that reminds them of the, their existence with the Kalar who remember and so can plan and those who forget to keep the work of the present continuing, in, unencumbered by memories of the past, which is pretty horrific, isn't it? Yeah. The palace Kalar have a backup of their memories and Pike wants them to go there to get Mbengas so they can save La'an. Both Spock and Ortegas blank out and in a panic she heads to the turbo lift. The corridors are eerily full of crew wandering aimlessly in the music. And one guy, did you see him yeah, sitting in the he looks corridor? Yeah, awful, doesn't he? Yeah. Poor chap. And the music does a great job of ramping up the disquiet as well. In our quarters, we see the debris field passing by in the window, which is a nice reminder of the danger they're in. And Benger is injured as they take on the guards at the gate, so has to hold off the other guards whilst Pike goes to their memories. The ship's computer reminds Ortegas that she's the ship's pilot, and she strides through the corridors with her mantra. We had a lovely effect shot of the Enterprise flying out of the debris field. And Ortegas also does a cool bit of blasting a hole in a large rock I to fly that. through, which is very, very fancy, but it's cool. I like it. Pike is taking names of his phaser rifle, trapping Zack in the throne room. Zack tells his former captain that the casket isn't real. Instead, it's the palace and the guard's helmets that are built a particular ore that protects them from the effects of the radiation. Zack claims the planet changes them, but Pike, getting his memories back finally, points out he remained loyal to his injured crew member. So no dice, dodgy guy, basically. Reflecting that it's good to have their memories back despite the pain they cause, La Arm does the eye tear thing at Mbenga. I wish I, I know they showed it in the recap, but I wish mm. I could I'm gonna have to rewatch season one to remember how that started. <laughs> Ironic. Luke has realised all the that all the Kalar need to know about their past, so yeah. Pike takes some of the ore on the planet to give the inhabitants back their memories. They sort of drop it on the planet. And, and justifies this seeming breach of the Prime Directive on the basis the initial asteroid that caused the problems wasn't a natural part of the planet's development. Actually, you know, does he lift the... He takes it away. That's it, the shuttles... Because this is great, because they don't put the Enterprise in the atmosphere, which it shouldn't be in. So they put the shuttles down into the atmosphere to tractor up the asteroid, and then the Enterprise kind of flips it yeah. into the, the debris field. I really like that. But the thing is, all of that's bollocks, though. Because it's like, yes, one asteroid changed the course of this planet. Mm-hmm. Arguably, it did in this one, because otherwise there'd still be fucking dinosaurs. You can't... Yeah, it, it's a difficult call, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's... I get that he wants to save them. He wants to give them their memories back, without yeah. it being a Starfleet thing. Mm-hmm. An obvious pointing to him. I understand that. But I think he should own that that's what he's doing. I don't think he can argue. Well, it's not natural development because of the asteroid, because the asteroid... It's helped. part of the natural world, isn't it? Yeah, so, it's part of the natural universe. Do you yeah. see what I mean? It's sort of... Yeah. Yeah. I, just, I mean, it's not the most egregious breaking of the prime directive we've ever had, <clears throat> Kirk, but, it, it, yeah, you're it probably is. right. It's, it's at least bending it, isn't it, quite Yeah, a bit. and I would, I would prefer it if he owned that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, possibly. And said instead something like the Prime Directive has already been broken. 
because it has been. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as in the, the interference has already happened, hasn't do, it? Do two wrongs make a right? Mm. No, but I'd rather <laughs> I'd rather he went down that route. Uh. This planet is not free of contamination. Yeah. So let's just try and make it better. And I'd rather he owned it and used it, argued that way, than try and say, well, no, because it's not from this planet, it's an asteroid, so I can do it. Because humanity wouldn't exist if there hadn't been a particular asteroid. No, fair point. No. Yeah. No. Pike apologises to Patel and thanks her for bringing him home by giving him the, um, the medallion thing. So that's quite sweet. Yeah. Uh, so here we get an actual strange new world, although somebody pointed out it's not technically new because, of course, they've been to it before, but only briefly. Yeah. Uh, but it's nice to be on a strange world anyway for the first time this season. There's explanation of how we need to deal with our grief rather than just forget things. Uh, it couldn't be more timely, really, with people doing whatever they can to pretend death isn't a thing these days and not even wanting funerals as a result. It feels like the show going back to his mission statement to me, personally. Also highlights how needed Pike is to make an episode feel like Strange New Worlds. <laughs> yeah, whereas I have mixed feelings about this one. I haven't mm watch this again because it pisses me off that they've forgotten all this stuff oh look you go into the palace and it's all fine you remember again how the ore has done damage what's her face says chapel says mm -hmm. to your synapses that's going to need to be healed removing the influence of whatever the radiation is is going to stop it getting worse well, okay. you're still going to need some form of treatment well, I can see that logic, in order yeah. to be back get back to where you were so if you say rather than being like dementia this is like having a stroke mm -hmm. you take away the cause yeah but you don't get better from a stroke straight away no, you yeah, have to have therapy, therapy and, yeah. and you know, and what therapy is needed depends on how the stroke has affected you. Um, some speech and language, OT, you know, variety. But on and the, that's what I would have... On the other hand, I do like the fact that deep down they remember at a core level who they are. So Pike remembers that he's concerned about these people there, his friends. He, did, yeah. he can't remember who he is even, but he just remembers he's responsible for them. I like and, that. And th that does fit And the with... fact that, you know, Zach went off the deep end, he's got no excuse for that, despite no. you know, the memory loss. He chose to do things the way he's done yeah. them. Yeah. And all of that I like, and all of it I'd be fine with, if it wasn't, snap your fingers better now. That is why I don't like this episode. Right. It's not what happens I can, on I the I can understand that, but ultimately, you know, par for the course for your typical episode but, of Star well, Trek. Just fucking inject <laughs> them with something. Make something up and give them a treatment. Don't just say uh -huh. it's all better now mm -hmm. because reasons. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Like, I get that they're in our future, so maybe they have a way to undo the damage yeah. and heal, but show treatment, mm -hmm. show healing, show that damage being undone. Also, I would argue, the more forgettings you've been through, the longer it should take for your memories to be able to return, mm -hmm. and the more impact it would, would have. And it's all sort of, oh, we're going to give them all their memories back. Not... We're also going to provide counselling for all the shit that they've... Yeah. There's none of that, is there? <laughs> no. There's no... I mean, this is where Lower Decks comes in again. Yeah, yeah, yeah they'll yeah. have to do the second contract yeah. now to help them out. Yeah, because yeah, they need it. They've just <laughs> done that and fucked off. Although, of course, they're not actually a war capable of civilization, so they shouldn't be interfering in the first place. But anyway... Uh, yeah, but do, do you see what I mean, though? Yeah. No, it's interesting the shoe is on the other foot. You know, I am I can understand completely why you have a problem with it, but it just doesn't bother me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it's it's not that I absolutely hate this episode, that's not true, but it frustrates me. I find it annoying because of the way it ends. But I do particularly enjoy the Ortegas aspect. <laughs> and that, that makes me grin, you know, mm -hmm. I, I was grinning from ear to ear when we was watching it just now. Whereas for me, this, this feels like what Strange New World should be doing. I really enjoyed this one. But let's find out what other people thought. Yep. And we've heard from Jeff, who writes, this is pretty much a textbook original series episode. Uh -huh. An away team encounters danger on a high concept planet while those left on the ship face tangentially related perils. Yep. There's even the requisite fisticuffs on the planet. <laughs> it's enhanced by the modern convention of character continuity and better special effects. Yes. Overall, a solid episode. Yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> I don't think it's a bad episode. I wouldn't go that far. I just need there to be some treatment. We've heard from Sampo and Yona. Hello. Hello. So we just watched Among the Lotus Eaters. What happened in it? Uh, 
I uh, 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 I can't remember. Ha 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 ha. So who are you and what's this thing in my hand and lotus? I mean, I guess some people ate some flowers or something. Lotus is our flower. I don't know how they are related to memory, though. Uh, I, I'm I'm guessing they'll tell us it's a quote from something famous and fancy, I guess. Yeah. So, what did you think of the episode? I guess it could have been named also as Day of the Ortegas mm-hmm. and the one where Mr. Pike learns the meaning of true love. Well, that's true. But okay, I've been complaining that these have been sort of centered around one or two people, these episodes. I mean, mm. this was a pretty, I think everyone was had a pretty big role. Mm, yeah, except Uhura. Uhura, who... exactly. Who just, she had a headache and that's the last we saw of her. Yeah. So, not sure what I guess this, what it reminded me of was the movie Father we watched some time ago about Alzheimer's. Mm. And I mean... Very good. Uh, the difference there, of course, in that movie, the viewer also didn't know what was true and what wasn't here. Mm-hmm. The viewer always knew what happened, so it wasn't as effective. But I'm, you know, I mean, that's one of the big fears most people have that you know you mm-hmm. lose your mind and yourself. As a concern, I mean, the, <laughs> this is a problem with giving feedback for strange new, new worlds because, again, I mean, I thought this episode was fine. I yeah. liked it, and it didn't raise any big emotions or any sort of ah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Although hmm? emotions eventually were the ones that kept the characters in in their places. That's right? true. So actually, they were. And then it was so hilarious when Spock tried to say to Ortega that feelings are actually not accurate, mm-hmm. and then the feelings were accurate, accurate, and hmm. it was the only thing they counted on. Yeah, uh, they were making such a big deal about how emotions stay and all the. Uh, facts sort of uh, go away or something mm. like that. I was expecting it to affect Spock differently or something because mm. he's most all logic and no emotions mostly. Yeah, I guess he's human enough. Yeah, I guess so because it affected him just mm. like everyone else. What do you think about the uh, thought that the old man had that he thought he was free because he didn't have his burden? I mean, I'm pretty sure that's what he thought just because that's all he had ever known. Mm. As soon as he got his memories back, he sort of changed his mind. That, Thank okay. you, Mr. Pike, for giving <laughs> my memories back. Yeah. And this makes me whole again. Okay, and again here, I mean, <laughs> this is something we never saw in the original series. That, oops, we <laughs> sort of <laughs> affected the original culture, but better go back and fix it. Or Yeah. They, they didn't. It was the asteroid again. They didn't do anything. It's oh, um, not y- even technically, but uh, they just didn't. They, they, they took the asteroid away. But uh, that's not no. bad, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's a technicality. I meant five mm. years ago when they left, sort of phasers and a crew member behind. So mm. yeah, but that's not half as bad as some of the stuff that Kirk will do or did do a time works strangely when when it's a prequel also this this uh, episode showed i mean the correct way and the wrong way on how to handle the situation where something strange happens mm. w- when laan loses six hours she's just like okay i'm feeling a bit dizzy but i'm fine let's just go on and when uhura has the same thing she's just okay i'm i'm not fine now and number one is okay go to the sick bay right now mm. it didn't help, maybe, but I mean, well, La- I should have mentioned that. By the way, I just lost six hours. Mm. Something is seriously wrong. <laughs> yeah. Although, if they had turned back, they most likely would have lost their memories and it just died in the mm. wasteland. So it turned out well in the end. The box that held the memories was very beautiful, a cathedral. Oh yeah, I mean, the story works if you think of the castle as the box. Mm-hmm. Instead of the ugly grey Starfleet box they had there. Mm. There were all kinds of boxes. Yeah. So, but I, I've got nothing else to say about this episode. I liked it. Let's watch the next one. Yes, in a few weeks. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yay! Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Yeah. yeah, you're right. The, the castle itself could be the box. And the totem uh-huh. would still be accurate. Yes, it would be. Yes. And I hadn't thought of it like that. Mm.
So thank you. Yeah, and Laan doesn't mention it's been six hours, but she does when they say, you know, we've been walking six hours, or whatever. She does go sort of really. It's, it's she does yeah. make a she just she's not specific, but it is clear that something's wrong. But it's very Laan to try and minimise that. Mm, it is. It's in character, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. She got to be strong at all times. Yeah. yeah. And you say everyone had a role except Ahura. There was no Pelia in this. No, no, not at all. She's got a hell of a lot of memories to forget, and she, mm, yes. she would have been bloody helpful, I think, yeah. because she would have remembered things, because it would have taken longer for her to do her forgetting, wouldn't it? Yeah, but I like the fact that Spot was as affected as everybody else, because certainly the original series episode, he isn't affected at all, and it's always a bit of a cliche, really. So, And also, why, given that emotion is not the cause, and the cause is just some form of radiation, why would he not be affected? Hmm. You know, like there's certain things you think it's logical for a Vulcan to not be affected, yeah. but with this one, like, if it were a next gen episode, Data might not be, yeah, because radiation wouldn't necessarily affect him in the same way because mm. he's an android, or maybe it doesn't affect a Klingon as much because they've got a stronger physique, maybe. Mm. But I can't see a logical reason why this wouldn't affect a Vulcan, yeah. and I like the fact that the Actually, he's affected as well. And he's... Because he keeps saying emotion isn't true, emotion isn't true. In a way, it kind of makes him worse. Mm. Because I get that Vulcans are a different culture. They're dealing with emotions in a different way for a different reason. There's a rationale why they're anti-emotion. But there is a form of truth in emotion that we know as humans. And initially, he is refusing to acknowledge even that. So that makes him worse off. Yeah. But he does sit down and trust Ortega at the end. Mm. He might not be able to explain it, but he's like, no, I trust you, I believe in you. And he's sincere when he says that. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks, guys. Thank you. What about the Llama God? What did he make of this? Llama God's logs, cut the fixy care, tree, yayig. I remember every little thing as if it happened only yesterday. Well, here we are then with the first episode of Strange New World Season 2 that isn't great, I'm sad to say. It's not a bad episode, but just not quite as good as the episodes that preceded it. Now, one of the things we've been complaining about so far this season is that we haven't yet had the whole crew together. It's been bits and segments of the crew. And in this episode, we do indeed have the whole crew all together. So this should be a good episode. But the problem is that it, it's not the whole crew, is it? I mean, obviously the crew's broken up with the number one team and, and the rest of the crew that's left on the ship. That's quite normal. But given the crew actually forgetting their memories, then we don't actually have the crew as being the crew and interacting as who we know them to be. So that doesn't really give us what we're wanting. So that's sort of four episodes now then where we haven't actually had the Strange New Worlds crew all together. Now obviously one of the things they can do with this sort of episode and Trek's already done it with the Naked Now and the Naked Time where you strip away some of the key things of a character in this case the memories and that can actually reveal more about who the character actually is and that's a valid storytelling tool and a perfectly logical thing to do especially in a science fiction format. Unfortunately in this episode do we really actually get to see who anyone else is? Do we actually get to learn anyone's deep inner truths from having their memories stripped away and reducing them to their basic instincts? I don't think they do actually. We don't really learn a lot. Everyone's just pretty much dazed. And the main thing we learn really is that Ortegas flies the ship and uh, we kind of knew that. We might also get the impression that Pike might actually be willing to commit murder in his attempts to protect those that he loves and cares about and that is certainly something that could be a revelation but it doesn't seem like it's followed up on at least in this episode anyway so yeah it's not really a particular revelation we don't really learn so much so there aren't any real revelations and as such it's kind of a wasted opportunity which is a bit of a shame. So yeah while this is something of a trope especially in science fiction circles it's not really used to the best effect here. Of course the other thing is that this series is called Strange New Worlds and have we actually seen any strange new world yet. I mean, this season anyway. It's always been places that other people have already visited. And this planet in particular, Rigel 7, is a planet the Enterprise crew have been to before. And yes, a good reason is given for that in this episode. But still, still, it's not that strange, not that new. So, yeah. But as I say, this episode isn't bad as such. The whole idea of Zack being left behind and taken over the planet, that's very TOS, isn't it? I mean, we've seen several episodes of the original series now in our rewatch where we've featured Enterprise captains have gone bad or crew members have gone bad and have disrupted societies. And so this fits in really nicely and it does make it very much a Star Trek-like episode. And we have the whole character of Luke who's really interesting as the native Rigelian who befriends them and his whole idea about memories and how life could be so much less painful if you didn't remember and then there's a whole argument that it's our pain that makes us who we are. I wonder if Star Trek has ever done anything about that before. I wonder if they've done like a film. Maybe the fifth of the franchise. Anyway, but yeah, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? And again, like the lack of memories, it's one that isn't actually followed through properly. At least I don't think it is and it's a shame because there's a really interesting thread there to tease on. But again, this is a comment that I made about some of the original series episodes where there's been the germ of a good idea which isn't actually followed through and yeah, I guess in a way this makes this the most TOS-like episode 
strange new world so far, which I guess is a thing. But yeah, it's certainly an episode of Star Trek. It just feels like they could have done with a couple more revisions, a couple more passes on the script before actually filming. So yeah, some nuggets of some good stuff, but not actually a decent finished product, unfortunately. The one big question it does leave me with, though, is what the hell is that on Pike's bedroom wall? You get a brief glimpse of it when Captain Patel's over there visiting him for dinner, and you get to see it seems like another most strange stone relief like we saw in the Starfleet courtroom a couple of episodes back. So yeah, what what is it with Starfleet and strange stone mules? Are they trying to tell us A1 secretly a Sith Lord at the moment? But anyway, yeah, so as I say, not bad, but not great either. So as I've been to find out what everyone else made of this, I hope everyone else is able to come up with equally poor excuses. And until next time, glory to you and your cast. I didn't notice anything on his bedroom wall. I didn't. The, the one thing I did notice was he's kind of like got a massive picture screen thing where he presumably he can change the picture because he's got like, I think it's like a pier, or, you know, a jetty or something. With okay. that's quite nice. normally you'd sort of expect to see out the ship, but actually this was obviously like a massive. Uh, oh, a bit like when it was the winter and you decided I'll tell you had to have a picture of a fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like that. <laughs> I didn't. It was hanging in midair. It didn't fucking work. <sighs> But yes, you're quite right. I don't want my pain taken away. I need my pain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought the world was pretty strange. I mean, all right, it's not new. I grant you that. But it was pretty strange. Everybody losing their memories and stuff. Yeah. That's certainly one of the, the most sci-fi feeling episode we've had yet this season, I think. And it was very TOS. Yeah, so a former yeah. Starfleet officer going mad yeah, and controlling going... a planet and making himself king. Very, yes. very TOS. <laughs> yeah. And... All right, so you don't learn that much about um, Benger or Laan, but I mean, basically, you, you know, you'll get to the core of who Pike is, that he deeply cares for these people, even though he's forgotten who they are. He, he's got this deep sense of care, and that goes back to those cadets he wants to save as well in the mm. first season, and has to, you know, yeah. realise that actually, by doing so, will mess up the timeline. Um, and I think we get to know Ortega's better. Yes, yes, we do. and Because it's clearly a key part of yeah. her. She'd been all like, I'm only flying the ship, I'm not going to the landing party. She's like, no, I'm Ortegas and I fly the ship. This is who I am. This is what I do. Yep. So I, And I like that. It's the, Orte- the fact that the solution doesn't work pisses me off more about the people on the planet because it affects the whole planet, if you see what I mean. And they don't have any support for what they've done to the but- poor people. Um, that it than it does the people on the ship. I still enjoy the Ortega stuff. And Pike also realises that he does actually really love Patel as well. You know, he's yeah. got this sort of... He, he, again, he can't remember who she is or anything. He just knows that somebody that was really important to him that gave him that medallion. So yeah, That's why he of... says to her, you know, you brought me home. Yeah. So and, I it's, quite sweet. and I like as well that he goes to the trouble, they, they find out, diverted two starships to try and get her back and just to apologise. Mm. And I like that as well. It's like... If something matters to Pike, it matters deeply and he yeah. does something about it. But I have a small niggle. Yeah. Which I've just remembered. Ortegas goes into the turbo lift and she's just staggering. She's really, she doesn't know what's going on. And she doesn't put her hand Hand on, on the, the thingy, thingy. no. <laughs> and it takes her where she wants to go anyway. Yeah. Whereas Why do trouble, they bother doing that? <laughs> in trouble, trials and tribulations. Yeah, they ask the computer. Space nine, yeah, ask the computer. It doesn't work, and Until Dax has to the... point out. No, you've got to hold the hammer. Yeah, you're quite right. Abu, the episode is ruined. <laughs> but it's odd, isn't it, that there's me with the one yeah, with yeah. the weird techie nitpick. Yes, I know. It's those very much uh, swap. Swap positions with this one. Next thing you know, I'll be spotting something about the uniform. Yeah, all the spaceships. Yeah, I didn't, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we hear from the Pie Man. Hi guys, Parry here to talk about Among the Lotus Eaters. Um, now, this one I didn't enjoy as much when I watched it first time, but I think I got more out of it this time. So the bits that I liked, I still liked, um, definitely. I liked returning to the planet from the cage. Um, and the fact that the planet kind of looks the same. It's like a high-budget version of a 1960s matte painting with all the flaws that have that. Sometimes the the area looked very barren and empty, Um, but it did relate to what we saw in the cage, so I quite enjoyed that concept. Um, And I really like the stuff on the ship. We've been complaining about Pike and uh, Ortega's not having much to do, and of course uh, you guys revealed that uh, the actor playing Ortega's was um, suffering a bereavement as well, so it's nice that they both kind of get a lot to do in this episode, kind of makes up for them 
um, being a bit sidelined in the last few. And in particular, Ortega's the quite cute bit with her desperate to go on an away mission. Um, add to her triumphant bit of, you know, I, 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 am, you know, I fly the ship. I love that. Um, and the kind of music. And I kind of liked, yeah, I think it still falls apart a bit that they didn't use the computer earlier. That someone should have maybe thought to have the computer just, uh, you know, shout out randomly who people are or, you know, something like that. But uh, I did like the fact that, yes, they had a thing there that would tell them who they are and what they had to do on the ship. But they had to remember it was there to use it, and that was their kind of big fall down. So that kind of worked for me. And the ship was quite eerie, you know, with people just wandering about almost zombie like, just because they've got no idea of what's going on. Um, you know, you've got a real sense of fear and tension. On the planet, again, you've got the same thing with our means you losing their memories because that's the gist of it. And I quite liked it was one of the um, one of the people who was left behind. And in fact, it was his yeoman, uh, if you remember, who was replaced with Colt, um, who got left behind. I'd have liked to have seen something a bit more of a reference to the cage-style uniforms, but I'm not going to push for that too much. Um, but yeah, I kind of liked the way that... Uh, he had kind of got resentful, and again, probably because he'd been through quite a horrible time losing his memory and whatnot, um, and he's now set himself up as a king, and he knows how that one ends as well. So, uh, so yeah, but he, he's sort of wanting revenge on Pike, and there is that bit where Pike looks like he's about to beat him to death or shoot him, and then his memories come back. Um, but, uh, yeah, and I think that's maybe the bit which I thought, I'm not sure I went on too long, too much of a phrase. I think there just needs to be a bit more. I think they, were, they sort of hinted at a lot of things, but didn't quite go enough places with them being sort of memory lost or with the attack. Although, again, the sort of ear ringing and cutting to lost time gave quite a good impression of the memory loss. So I think it was well put together. I, I don't quite know how you could have done this better. I just think there's a way that you could have made a slightly more compelling episode. But I was still very good and I enjoyed it more this time. I thought the themes of, again, the theme of uh, Pike's relationship with Battelle and him pushing people away, and I liked the conversation between Pike and Una. Um, I thought that was actually quite sweet, uh, very much you know, showing their friendship there, and her pulling him up in his relationship advice. So lots of nice little features, and like I say, we got to see some characters we don't do didn't see too much with um, this time round, and a bit of resentment from um, uh, Mbinga about uh, being brought in for his combat skills. I also like that. So yeah. Um, overall, I think this is actually a more solid episode than I possibly gave it credit for when I first watched it. So, yeah, I'd, I mean, again, I think possibly where this negative view of Strange New Worlds comes from is that uh, there are now flaws in the episodes, whereas, uh, you know, before with the, the first series, it was just knocking out blinders left, right, and centre. And this one, they've maybe had, it's, you're maybe having to, to put in the work a bit more for it to, to like it. So, uh, yeah, all it remains for me to say is do keep up the good work. I always look forward to the podcast, and I hope to be back to the next one. But until then, bye for now. ta Bye! Yeah, I think there are flaws in the episodes, but I don't blame them. They're trying new things, and I think Strange New Worlds is also kind of like a strange new way of doing Trek, and I don't blame them for exploring new ways of doing things. Some of these you'll like, and some of these you won't. As I said, for me, it was the resolution that was an issue rather than anything else. In terms of why they didn't use the computer earlier, I genuinely don't know how they would have managed it with so many people. Mm. It, one person, totally get how it can help one person. And Ortegas was the one who I thought of it's too strong a word. She kind of accidentally stumbled on mm. it. I'm not sure that there was a solution. I suppose you could have had the computer repeating, you are the crew of the Starship Enterprise, but it couldn't have done anything more individualised than that. And generally the computer only does stuff if you ask it to do it, and yeah. they're not in, they're in no state to do that. So, no. as you say, Ortega's kind of gets some help accidentally. And you could argue that somebody might have managed it deliberately, but it only works for one person. Yeah. You can't have the computer giving individual instructions to absolutely everybody. It would just create a cacophony and probably more confusion. Yeah. That's my thinking, anyway. Mm. Uh, yes, I love the restaging of the map painting from the cage. I mean, it's it's very nice. Yes. Good. Right. Well, next time, recording on Wednesday the 27th. Can't think why that might be a bit earlier. Hmm. Um, <laughs> we're looking at charades. Oh, good. More Spock to bring. My favourite bit of Strange New Worlds. Oh, boy. Here we go. <laughs> I know yeah. the episode you mean. I know 
what happens in it. I just I, the, the whole Tapri thing has never worked for me. It didn't work. It was one of the few bad things about the first season, and it's like, oh, good, we're doing it again, are we? Hooray. Because it just does Well, we'll talk about it next week. We'll talk about it next week. <laughs> for me, there's key levels on which it works as a metaphor, and I'll say no more than that. Okay. Until then, take care. Cheery bye. Boysy boy. The Star Trek theme was written by Alexander Courage and here was arranged and performed by Drew Barker. The artwork was created by Andy Pelastides. All music referenced is for illustrative purposes only and no copyright infringement is intended. Find our website at broadcast.libsyn.com And we have a YouTube channel as well. Send emails or mp3s to broadcast at gmail.com Shut it down!